Okay, so I'm a Swiss naturopath. I'm working as the coordinator for HPCM. HPCM is the health professional for cellular medicine. It is a complementary organization from the Dr. Raff Health Foundations. I will explain who is Dr. Raff after. So I work only to bring the science of what the foundation has found. Because once the science studies have been proven, have been accepted, they end out on a table or in a drawer. Means the doctor don't know, the public don't know, and the therapists don't know. So HPCM was created to take those studies and to bring it to the people and the therapist, for them to know what we can do with natural therapy. So I will start. So I will speak this morning about cellular medicine and heart disease. So, yeah. Perfect, so the summary will be, what is cellular medicine? Cardiovascular disease, explanation from the doctors, what they tell you when you have a heart disease or when you get controlled. The health cost, or should we speak about disease cost? Because health won't cost that much. Cholesterol and heart disease, the causes of heart disease, animal and heart disease, heart failures, arrhythmia, hypertension, and then I will reply to your questions. If I'm a bit short on time, I will reply to your questions just on the little table outside. Okay. Excuse me? Yes. Is it possible to get home with the slides later, or do I have to write you in that? Yes, if you want to have uh, the slides, yeah. it's possible, of course. You just have to write your name on this, and uh, I will send you the email with the PDF. I cannot send you by email the PowerPoint because there is too much mega. And when I tried before, it's never going through the mail. So I change my mail into a PDF, and I send it by email. Okay, great. Yeah. But you have to put your name on this. And please, when you write your names, put it in capital letters. Because sometimes I get back in Switzerland, and I say, OK, I have to send to the, the student, and I cannot even read it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will do it, no problem. So what is cellular medicine? Cellular medicine is a medicine that treats the cells. What is what, sorry? Cellular medicine. This. I apologize for my pronunciations, as I'm not from England. Thank you. So as you know, treating at the level of the cells is a bit different than what does the normal doctors. Because the doctors, they are specialized. They have a heart specialized, lung specialized, gastrointestinal specialized, nervous specialized. They all specialize in organs. They don't really treat the cells. Us, we treat the cells because the cells is the base, is the roots of all organs. So by treating the cells, we can get to the root of the problem, because that's where it started. And the disease originates at the level of the cells. Whatever it is, uh, endothelium, a liver cells, a muscle cells, a connective tissue, a blood cells, but they're specific because there is no nucleus in the blood cells, or, a nerve, ce or nerve cells, it's all start the same. So how does a cell work? Every cell works the same. You can imagine a little city or a little village with a city hall. The city hall will be the nucleus because the city hall holds the archive of the city, the information of every inhabitant of the city. So in the nucleus, you have something called the DNA or the ADN, or RNA. It's all the archives from the cells, how it should work, when it should stop, etc. Everything is inside this. The power stations to provide electricity to the people, to the, to the cells, is called a mitochondrium. That's inside these little buildings. There is a lot of them in the cells that the cells can provide the energy to survive and to create this function. The factory to produce, to take the nutrient, is called a Golgi complex. It is simplified. If you take a course of biochemistry, it will be more complex than this. It is an image to explain you where I want to, to bring you to explain what is cellular medicine. So inside the mitochondrium, you need proteins, carbohydrates, fats, of course, what we call macro element, but also vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and amino acids. All this will allow the cells to get the energy that it requires to do its function. If you lack some of those nutrients, the cell, of course, will still work, but it will not be optimal. It will have some dysfunction. Then after we can put names on those dysfunctions. Okay, so what is important that you know about cellular medicines is that we use vitamins, minerals, trace elements, amino acids, some of them, mainly the essential ones, and other substances like polyphenols, which are very interesting to stay healthy. So this is a bigger plan of what we call the cycle of citrates, or Krebs cycle. This is what will create energy with ATP, ADP, and so on. 
But what I want you to focus on is that to get a proper energy, we need all this. Vitamin C, all the B vitamins, coenzymes, oligo element, etc. Without this, it won't work correctly. But it will work, but not correctly. What you need to know before I start also is that there are symptoms that we need to take care of. Like if in this room is becoming hot and we lack oxygen, we will suffocate. That's the symptom. We, we will feel that we lack oxygen. And if we don't get oxygen, in a few minutes, we die. That's logic. If we lack water, if we need water, the symptom is the thirst, so we have to drink. If we don't drink, well, we die in a few months, a few days, sorry. Yeah. And if we lack nutrition, we'll be hungry. That's the symptom. And if we don't eat, after 40 days, 50 days, we die. If we lack a nutrient for the cells, there is no symptoms. No symptom at all. Maybe you'll get a bit less energy, maybe you'll get a bit forgetting things, but it's no big symptoms. But then you get a stroke in two seconds, 10 years after. Yeah, you can get a diabetes like that, you become diabetes type two. But it was 10 years of preparation before, because there is no symptom to tell you that you like nutrient. Of course, there is specific test you can do, but you will not feel it. So this concept was created by Dr. Raff in 1992. The idea, of course, was before this date. That was me and Dr. Raff in Holland when I got to create the HPCM in July 2011. It's quite a young project. So who is Dr. Raff? He's the founder of cellular medicine. He was also the head cardiologist for the Linus Pauling Institute when Linus Pauling was still alive and leading the institute. He was a close friend from Linus Pauling, which I recall was a two times Nobel Prize, the only human on earth with two Nobel Prizes that he didn't share. He also researched natural components to stop cancer with his team. I will not speak about this today, but what he found on cancer is really, really interesting. In fact, we can block the cancer on the fourth phase at any stage with what he found, but it requires life, lifestyle changing, of course. Okay, he's not alone. So his team is the Dr. Alexandra Dizviki. She's uh, here. She's the head biochemist of the foundation in California. There is a Dr. Raxi Jariwala, which is right here, which is the specialist for uh, infectious disease, like the one who studied the uh, HIV, VIH, and all these things. Dr. Vadim Ivanov, which is here, is the head cardiologist of the institute. And Dr. Wahid Rumi, right there, is the main guy for the oncology and toxicology also. And John Cha is the, the, the people I speak to, it's him, who give me the studies when I need to give to the therapist. When a new study arrive, or when I need a study, I talk to John, he give me the study, because they have thousands of them. Okay, so let's start. Cardiovascular disease. So the WHO said that 17.3 million people died from cardiovascular disease in 2008. That's a lot of people. In fact, in 2008, cardiovascular disease was the number one killer. Now it's cancer, but before it was uh, cardiovascular disease. Over 80% of cardiovascular disease death take place in the low and middle income countries. In fact, even in the Emirate Arabic, they die from heart disease. It touched everybody. And you will understand later why. The prevision, if we do nothing about it, which is too late for that already because we start to do things about it, but if we do nothing about it, by 2030, it will be 23.6 million people that will die on a yearly basis from cardiovascular disease. So even if it's the number two killer, it has to take our attention to do something about it, especially when you know that all of you can do something about it. That's the new chart from WHO about the disease of the world. So we see that the number one killer is of course the infectious disease in the poor countries. We see that the number two killer, but number one in civilized countries is cancer. And number two killer in civilized country is heart disease. So it has to be taken seriously. So the equivalency of the business with disease from the pharmaceutical business, I use this term because when somebody has a high cholesterol, arrhythmia, or any problem with the heart, they have to take medications for life. That's why I use the word business, because it's a long-term client. I will go on this later. And actually, I took this thing from England. The people who die 
from cardiovascular disease is the equivalency of Leeds, Bradford, Liverpool, or Sheffield on a yearly basis. It's quite a lot of people that died from this, which is largely preventable. So what are the causes of cardiovascular disease? Because there is a reason for that. It's not only fatality. So we know that smoking is a risk, so we can avoid tobacco. We know that inactivity is a risk also. If we do nothing, it's a problem. You know, all extremes are a problem. Too much sport is a problem, not sport is a problem. We have to find the, the middle about that. Bad food, correct nutrition. I believe correct nutrition you will learn in CNM. <laughs> it's also a problem that creates cardiovascular disease. You will learn after a while. Obesity is also a problem that can create cardiovascular disease. Alcohol is also a risk. And the lack of vitamin C is a big risk. We will see later why. So smoking, I will not go too deep on that because smoking cigarette, it's written now on the packs that it kills. So if people choose to smoke, it's their choice, but they have to take the package. <coughs> Bless you. Physical inactivity. With some motivation, I believe it's easy to get active. To step on a bike, to walk instead of the dog there. It's, that's something that is largely preventable and that we can change if we really want to. And to take the TV out and all this. Obesity. Before we reach that point, there is a lot of things we can do. And once you reach that point and you want to change, it's possible to change. It's just about consciousness. So it's preventable. Alcohol in England, when I was here last time in 2011, in September, if I remember correctly, I saw this article that paramedics in England has to deal with 188 drunken per day. So this has to be prevented. And while I was walking to my hotel, I saw a lot of pubs. <laughs> I said, oh la la. <laughs> That's why there is this problem. But if the young people choose to drink a bit less, they can prevent that already. So it's not a big problem. Then heredity, genetic. Sometimes the doctor tell you it's genetic. Really? Yes, there is some genetic problem. Sometimes there is a heart deformations. Sometimes there is a, hello, please have a seat. Sometimes there is a problem with the heart as a genetic problem, which is about 2% of the time. This doesn't explain why people die from this at this scale. And you must know that genetic, it's a slide I took from my cancer presentation. So breast cancer presentation is not important. What I want to show you with this slide is that all the red parts are the DNA that are modified when you drink a cup of green tea. If you take a hamburger, it will modify as well. But the study was done with green tea. So we see that nutrition, after two hours, already acts on our DNA. So the genetic is not something stable. Of course, I will not wake up in the morning being myself and the next day being uh, African of 1 meter 80. I mean, genetic will not change that way. But my cells, your cells, change every second. So it's not a fixed thing. So it's not really genetic. Is age a factor of heart disease? Well, if age was a factor of heart disease, we would have no old people. It's mainly a way of life. Because as I shown this picture, age, she smoked, she's 100 years old, still alive. This guy is about more than 80, still alive. So it's not age. It can be a contribution, but it's not age. So the cause of coronary heart disease depends on the way you live your life. They depend on the risk you take, on unhealthy eating, on lack of specific nutrient, and this is in red. Lack of exercise. Smoking also is a big risk. Alcohol abuse. All this you can manage. Heredity, age, have we missed something? Yes, stress. Yes, it's also stress, of course. But stress is uh, with the hormonal system, with the adrenaline, and I will go to this later. Because when you have a stress, to neutralize it, you need vitamin C. That's why I put lack of nutrient. This is linked to stress. We know now the NASA has made some tests, the Army, American Army has made some tests, that the soldiers, we can stand there with the firing arms and they stay calm and they wait. They check their blood, they have a high level of vitamin C. So we can say that resisting to stress depends on your blood level of vitamin C. Interesting to know. So we miss stress, it is true, but what we miss is the secondary effect of the medications, which are also a big risk. Most of this, Vioxx, Celebrex, Diclofenac, Zelnom, and so on, are painkillers. All of them give a 40% to 60% risk of heart disease. So you take a medication for your, yeah? The painkillers. 
from 40 to 60 percent. But if you buy the product and you read the notice, it's written. But the people sometimes they just take the prescription from the doctor and they don't read the risk. That's what medications are they? Oh, those are mainly painkillers here. Oh, this is a Vioxx. Yeah, it's you have a. Yeah, because it was taken out of the market. No, now it's being taken out. Because it was killing people. Every year you have new medication because they take out the others. Oh, Mediator was a big, of course, everywhere. Which one? Well, Mediator. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not here yet. Oh, here, right here, uh, exactly. And yeah. er, exactly, right there. So what you will see later, I will speak about it also, is that medication are on the market, new medications every year, not to say every month. And every year they take it out of the market because there is secondary effect. That's why I speak of a market with the pharma. We'll get to that. The secondary effect, like Zetia, Vitorin, Erzitrol, Zocor, Forzilin, all this creates heart disease. That's a lot of them. And that's what I found also when I was here last time. A painkiller called diclofenac creates 40% risk of heart disease. And in this article, they say 40% is not too much. <laughs> if I have a gun with 10 rounds and I put four bullets inside, I will not play with it. <laughs> so that's what, it, that's what it is. So watch the medication you take as well. It's a big risk. So what does the doctor tell you? They will tell you first if you ask the questions. Otherwise, if you don't ask the questions, at least in my country, they tell you nothing. <laughs> That's why it's important to ask questions. They will tell you that 90% of heart disease are from all known cause. You have it, but we don't know why. So why are these specialites of the heart? I don't know. <laughs> atherosclerosis is due to an excess cholesterol. So what is atherosclerosis? I explained at the beginning. It is the plaque that starts to grow here. For unknown reason. It's not the lipoprotein A, no? Oh, it's lipo A. But they say cholesterol. Yeah. But if we go to the scientific literature, it is lipoprotein A. It's going around the cholesterol. But I have some graph to show you with this. Or they will tell you it is genetic, or it is due to a virus or a bacteria, or it is LDL that has been oxidated. You know, it's like when you have oil on the casserole, you eat it up, it's oxidated. So that's why there is arteriosclerosis, and then atherosclerosis. That's what they will tell you. And what they forgot to tell you is that most of the time it happened in this part of the heart. 90% of the time is in here. It's not here or here. It's always here. It never happens inside the heart. So what do they do for that? Because they are official treatment. There is what we call angioplasty or stent. So they will go inside the plaque with a needle. They inflate the balloon. They take out the needle. So they squeeze the plaque on the side. Okay, that's what they do. Then they give you medication for life with uh, aspirin cardio, beta blockers, and so on. That's the treatment. So it's not a treatment because you take it for life. It's a uh, key, you know, when you walk like that. Or they can propose surgery, pacemaker, valve replacement, or transplantation, depending on what there is. Nutrition, they don't know. No advice about this. So the treatment requires that you take medicine for your life because it doesn't treat the root of the problem. Let's speak about the cost of that. This was the cost on the 1980, 1990. It started to rise with the HIV problems because the researchers start to research something that they will never find. So health cost goes up. I would say disease cost because health, you pay for health? No, you pay for medications when you're not really in shape. That's the projection for 2006 until 2017. It's not going down. Huh? So we have to change something in the system. And Frank Zappa, which was a rock star, said the mind is like a parachute. It works only when it is open. Every time I speak to a doctor, most of the time, they say, oh, I don't believe this. I don't bring you belief today. I'll bring you science, science fact that can be produced in any university. So if the cholesterol was the problem, why most animals do not suffer from heart disease, except gorillas and some other primates, including humans? That's because of the old animals. They produce inside, they have a gene called gluonolactone oxidase that produce their vitamin C. And animals do not produce lipo A. We will see that later as well. Why does the plaque narrow and clog the coronary arteries? This part, as I said before. It's a big artery. Why is it not clogging the finger arteries, which is small, or the nose or the ears? We never get infraction from the ears or the, or the nose or the fingers. How come? The doctors don't know. We'll go to that later also. 
Why aren't the blockage and fraction more common to the blood system? Okay, I saw that already. And why is there no venosclerosis? Because from my belief, the hypothesis of cholesterol, and when I study physiology, cholesterol is not only in the arteries. It is everywhere in your body, and the vein system as well. But we never saw in the whole humankind history a venosclerosis. How come? And the veins are also near the heart. Veins are everywhere. Well, why is the cholesterol or lipoprotein A elevated in heart patient? I answer to that question after. Suspense. <laughs> why have major cholesterol drug studies not released the raw data to scientists? Because you know, in the pharmaceutical, when they make a study out of a medications and the people start to die, let's say at five months, six months, they release the data at four months. They say it's safe. So then you have some range of selling the product for one year, two years before it's taken out of the market. That's why I speak about business. And why do more than 50% of the heart attack and stroke occur in people without any generally accepted cardiovascular risk factor? Means that they have a heart disease or brain failure with a normal cholesterol. Why? More than 50%. That's because the hypothesis of cholesterol is totally wrong. Yes, it will go after. Homocysteine is only one factor, a dangerous one, but it's neutralized easily with vitamin B. And why do people with low cholesterol still suffer from heart attack and stroke? You'll get the answer after also. A lot of questions, huh? And why do about half of the surgical heart procedure fails? I showed you the stent before. You must know that I treat heart disease patients. Sometimes, two years after, they have to redo the operation because inside the stent, it's been blocked again. So the stent is not a solution. And uh, how come the heart disease has been going down? It was very high in the past, still very high today, but it is lower than what it used to be. When Linus Pauling got his book out on the market in the 70s about vitamin C and the common flu, because he wrote his book, people start to take vitamin C. You can see here the numbers. Very high, 521, then he write his book, 496, 436, 368. People start to apply the theory. Until we got here into 2009, 2011, where cancer has beaten heart disease. Okay, there is more cancer, but heart disease is also going down a bit. Thanks to Linus Pauling. The cholesterol theory has not answered these questions, but the Pauling rat unified theory does. So what is the unified theory? That's what it is. On a biological way, human beings, to protect the arteries, they produce lipoprotein A, which is the number two cause of death at the moment. Animals, they cannot produce inside their body lipoprotein A, so they cannot get the, plug, the clogged arteries. But you will tell me then it can be getting old and crack. They don't get scurvy as well because they produce vitamin C. That's what's important to know. We don't. So we can imagine that the first problem with heart disease is like a preform of scurvy. Because if we take an optimum intake of vitamin C, of course, it's not only acid ascorbic, it can be ascorbate of calcium, ascorbate of magnesium, palmitate of ascorbyl, many shapes of vitamin C that exist. The arteries stay clear, always clear. If we like vitamin C, we will notice that there are some lipo A that start to get there, but not for decoration. If we don't take vitamin C, we have a disease called arteriosclerosis. It means the arteries start to be cracked. Hello. And the body will not let that happen, cracking arteries and the blood going inside the body. And No, no, that's called scurvy. So to repair the arteries, the liver is going to get the lipoprotein A to cover those cracks. That's where the plaque are occurring. Notice that this will not open, this will not happen if we have vitamin C because it stays on a good shape. Now some doctors will tell you that the arteriosclerosis occurs because of a virus or because of a bacteria. That's the theory that they start to give on 2010, 2011, which might be true also because there is some factors that attack the vascular wall. But if we have vitamin C, bacteria and viruses, they're dead. It's like an antiseptic in the body because animals do not get attacked by virus or bacteria on their artery wall. Then vitamin C is a virus killer. So the unified theory still works as a theory here because it's protect and stabilize the artery wall. So as you said before, Another risk factor would be the homocysteine. We will see it after also. So this is a fat particle from the low density lipoprotein. Um, we, we call it the bad cholesterol. Even though it's vital, it's not bad. So the lipoprotein is going around it. It's stick to it. And that's how it is able to go 
on the arterial sclerosis to repair it. The animal cannot do that. And then it gets clogged up because there's too much of it. Exactly. And then it reduces the caliber of the arteries. And with the pressure, it can be released. It's a plaque that is released that can create a brain failure or heart failure. With vitamin C, you resorb that. But to resorb the lipo A, vitamin C will not be enough. It's only the prevention device and the cure device. But once you reach this state, we need something else. Homocysteine is also a great medical risk that your doctor will never talk to you about, even though it's a normal medicine. Because homocysteine will attack the vascular, the, the artery walls. Everywhere, everywhere. That's why sometimes we have heart problems coming from another artery than the coronary. But it's easily to neutralize, because if you take vitamin B6, B9, and B12, you convert homocysteine into cysteine and methionine, which are good for us. So people who have a high homocysteine, it's mainly because they lack nutrient, they lack vitamin B. So that's how it works in a heart disease. They begin like that. Whenever there is a virus or not, it's the same. There is a lack of vitamin C, so there is arteriosclerosis, so repair is needed. Virus bacteria, possible, but if we have the vitamin C here, there's no virus or bacteria. Then arteriosclerosis is occurring. Then after the factor of reparation is coming from the liver, the lipoproteins are launched to repair the artery walls. Then we call this atherosclerosis. So it's not unknown, we can explain how it goes. Then we have a high lipo A in the blood. Sometimes the doctors all the time forget to measure it. Then you get hypertension, most of the time. Because the arteries looks like this. And then, if nothing is done, you get a heart or brain stroke. Depends where the plaque will be released. That's a short resume. But I think it's quite clear. Hi. Yeah, please, do. So, why wasn't medical history and science investigate the RAF polling theory, which is only exposed now? Which makes sense. We have been testing it on humans, on animals, and in the lab. Well, here is the main reason. If your cells are not working properly at the beginning, because you don't take enough vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, as I said at the beginning, your cell will work, but they will not be optimal. And if they're not optimal, you have a high risk of getting disease after long terms, like heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, hypertension, cancer, osteoporosis, arthritis, and so on. Those are the, the top benefiting. Each one of these diseases brings money to the pharmaceutical. Each one of them. My numbers are a bit too low, but only heart attack, heart disease, bring 200 billion per year on the pharma. Stroke, about 50 billion, because it's a bit less. High blood pressure, 150 billion. Cancer, a bit more than that. Osteoporosis, etc. So it's a market. So once you understand that heart disease is an early stage of scurvy, that Without vitamin C, this is what happens. And then you have the lipo A that will make a stroke or a heart attack. It's quite an easy theory to understand. When I was in the, in the naturopathic school, we had some doctors to teach us the heart disease. We had so many pathologies to study, so many mechanisms to learn, to tell you at the end that main cause is unknown. When I met Dr. Raff and I had this theory, I said, but it's so easy, so easy. Then I read the studies, it makes sense. Then I treat the patient and they got better. It was strange. So I continue and here I am. <laughs> so once you understand this, that arteriosclerosis will not happen if you take on a daily basis vitamin C, it's great. But it will not be enough to get rid of the lipoprotein A. Because that's the dangerous guy. It's not the cholesterol. Forget the cholesterol as a danger. It's a vital element. That's how it goes. When the repair is needed, you have the fibrin and the lipo A. They're going to be clogged on the arteries, up and down. They reduce, they break. That's how we get the problem. That's the front view. You see, from the reparation to the narrowing, from here to here, it can take 10 years with no symptoms. But if there is a blood that is coagulating right into there, you can make the heart disease, the stroke, in a few seconds. You see the preparation that there was before. It's important to investigate. Now, why is it always, 90% of the times, on the coronary artery that it's occurring? Well. As you know, the heart is not a static machine. It's pumping. Now you're sitting down, it's pumping still. I'm talking, it's pumping. It never stops until we die. So hopefully it will pump for a long time. So the coronary artery, which are really close to the pumping, 
are stressed, they are squeezed. They have to go from very high to very slow every time. This is why they need the vitamin C to be repaired every time. Otherwise, they do the arteriosclerosis. That's why when you hear the word, there is arteriosclerosis near the coronary arteries. 90% of the time, it's logic. It pumps right there. There will not be arteriosclerosis in here. It's a bit too far to be affected by the pumping. Yes? Oh, well, if you want a general statement, it's individual. But I say with everyone with three to four gram a day, you should be fine. If you're healthy, three to four should be okay, yes, on a daily basis. But now, the, if you want to know your maximum intake of vitamin C, you have to take it every day, three, four, five, six grams, until you get a laxative effect. Yeah. Once you get the laxative effect, you can reduce of one gram, see if it stays, then you will know your optimal intake. Me, as an example, I have a healthy food. I try, <laughs> even when I travel. If I take 15 grams of vitamin C, I get no laxative effect. 15? One five, yes. For three days, then I start to have a little, little laxative. Three days. And uh, this means that my biology, my way of work, the conference, the traveling, is asking my body a lot of vitamin C. Mm. I had a yoga teacher coming to the, um, to the practice because she injured her ankle. And we spoke about heart disease because of her student. I told her to take vitamin C. After one gram, she had diarrhea. So the dosage is really individual. Yes, intravenous treatment. Yeah. And obviously, when you take the vitamin C from oral, then I know that by the big job, what you when you just take it and otherwise you release the day. Because the vitamin C is not building in your body, just daily you can take it. It has to be taken daily, yes. But when you take oral, just one milligram you can take in your blood. But when you eat big with uh, IV, uh, 17.5 or 100 milligrams also as well, especially for cancer people. Yes, for cancer people you can inject on a daily basis for five days 30 grams in the blood with the NACL. And this is the way how you clear the whole, I mean, arterial and vascular system? No, it won't be enough. No. If you're healthy and you do IV, I do IV every week, 15 grams, because I like it, because it's helped me to travel with the radiation and all that. That's my choice. But. To prevent, it's good. To take it on the long term for everyone, it's necessary. But once you get the lipo A, it will not be enough. I will show you a patient paper just after, and you will see the numbers with the homocysteine and the lipo A. That's why you need other component. Excuse me. Yes. So, so, sorry about this slide. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry to be slow, but I'm not with you about number one. Why is it just artery, which is new? Oh, and no vein. Because there is no venous sclerosis. Only the arteries is weakened because it's inside the heart yeah, here. Uh, Yes, because heart disease and the lipoprotein A never happen in the vein, never. Why is that? Because the plaque of reparation is always occurring in the arteries, not in the vein. Because with the vitamin C of the arteries, we can repair it. And the veins are too far from the heart to be damaged. That's why there is never a vein that is blocked. It never happened. Stress on that. Yeah, exactly. Number two is the mechanical stress. Yes, because the heart pumps every day. 100,000 times. Yeah, yeah I, I'm with you about that. But about number one, I thought that if um, deficiency is essential. Yes, but what, look at the heart here. It's pumping. Yeah. This is this artery, what we call the coronary artery, right there. This is the one that often gets the arteriosclerosis. Mm -hmm. That's why we get the heart attack. If the, if the um, plaque is not big enough, it can pass through here, and then it will get to the brain. Then you get a stroke for the brain. If it's big enough, it's blocking this artery here, and you get a heart attack. Why is it this one? Because when the body pumps, when the heart pumps, it's under a lot of stress right there. So the vein here is not touched at all. The other veins are not touched at all. That's why it never happened in the vein. What I think she's perhaps getting a little confused is the, the artery wall. Oh, yes, the artery wall, yes. Inside, inside, inside the, the artery, artery. yes. So I thought that it was the, the reason was just one mechanical stress. Oh, no, no, no. We cannot change that. We cannot say to our heart, go to pause, break. No, he has to pump every time. So since we cannot act on the heart, we have to act on the, on the stability of the artery wall. And this we can do by taking vitamin C. Because when you take vitamin C, you reinforce the artery wall. Of course, it will reinforce the vein wall and reinforce all your body. 
But the heart attack occurred because of the arteries. Even the doctors agreed on that. Because they never saw venous sclerosis. So it's the only vitamin C that helps? No, 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 no. It's not finished, my presentation. Yeah. It's just to tell you that it is the big thing. Take it, I insist. Since here, I don't know if there is sudden or not. Anyway, generally, it will help. Yes, for generally for health, to stay healthy and get rid of heart disease, take vitamin C. Yeah. But it's more complex. We get to the complexity now. Now, if you want to get rid of the lipoprotein A, you see you were faster than me with the slides. <laughs> to get the lipoprotein A, vitamin C will not do it. You need two amino acids for that, called lysine, which is essential amino acids, and proline. Together, they will get around the lipoprotein and will get rid of the glue. Then it can leave the arteries. That's when the vitamin C can start to repair. Because it is not possible to repair the arteries if you have all this on top of it. Proline and lysine. But if you have vitamin C at the first place every time, you will not need that. That's why animals don't get heart disease. So to stabilize the arteries, you need vitamin C, vitamin E, mainly the alpha tocopherol, even though all the tocopherol are useful, and the tocotrienol as well. The blood fats, because we need cholesterol to stabilize arteries. Yes? No, sir, it's just me. Okay. And with all this, the arteries stay clear. And if they're not, you clear them with the proline and lysine. And with the IV, it's also a good thing to speed up the process. Because to do this, with nutrition, it will take about four to five months. It took 10 years to be in place, it takes four to five months to repair. Can you recommend how much we should take for each thing? At the end. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and here you see that if the collagen is stabilized, the artery stays clear. But this is decided at a cellular level. Now, the studies we've done to patients with high cholesterol, high lipoprotein. After one year, we dropped it to be normal. It takes six to 12 months. Some patients react faster, some patients react slower. Of course, if the patient smokes, it will be slow. If the patient don't do store, sport, it will be slow. If the patient is obese, it will be slow. So it's individual. But my message is, we can do it. That's possible with everyone. Exactly. But the length will be different. Some people will do it in six months. Others will do it in one year. But everyone can do that. So this was on a CT scan with a patient. You have this in the Dr. Raff book. This was a, a plaque on a left coronary artery, if I remember. So it's on this part here. So with the CT scan. And what they recommend the doctors here is a surgery. The patient was not really too hot on surgery. He didn't really want to try that. So he took nutrient, no IV, just oral nutrient. After six months, the same artery, no more plaque. So I'm aware that when you take vitamins and any food orally, we will have a loss. So when you take five grams of vitamin C, you know that at least two grams will arrive in the blood cells. So it's important to have at least two to five and to find your own dosage. And if you do IV and you know how to do it, then use it. But it's if, faster. But if you have a laxative effect, is that your body telling you it's got enough? Yes. Because you know, some people told me, some doctors, that was a shame of them, that if you go to urinate vitamin C because you have too much. No, if it's in the urine, it means it went through the blood. So it was useful. Yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah, it's horrible. I mean, uh, because I know. You see what I mean? Voilà. Yeah. If it's going through the other part, that's because it's an excess, it's not fixed. And even if you lose it this way, saying it's useless, no, no. It acts as a disinfectant. It acts as a virus protector. It acts as a bacteria protector. So even if you take too much and you have a laxative effect, it's okay. It's a cleaning. Take it like that. My breastfeed, so if I take even one gram, my baby is up. Exactly. <laughs> yes. It depends. For some people, it can be one gram one day. And two hours after, they have a laxative effect. <laughs> For other people, it can be 15 grams, can be three days without a laxative effect. Uh, I shall say you can take, you can start at three, and then increase of two grams every day to see. Yeah, that's one of the strategy, but there are many strategy. That's one of my patients, which came um, to see to see me because she already had a heart problem. She had an infraction. She had infarctus, a stroke, sorry, and uh, she was drinking every day. She's a people from the high society. She dress well, she eats well, too well sometimes, she don't do sport, she's not overweight, but anyway. And I said cholesterol is a bit high, but I'm not interested in cholesterol. I want to see your lipoprotein and the homocysteine. So before I got this document, it was a few months because, because the doctor did not want to do that. It's an official test, but they have a barrier, you know? It's like you tell them lipoprotein A, they get sick, the doctors. <laughs> it's, it's like a disease, try it. The more you try it, the more they'll do it. So a lipoprotein A was 841. Normally it's 300 maximum. It means she could have another heart attack at any time. The arteries was really within. 
because it's not possible for you as therapist or patient to ask the doctor to do a CT scan to see the state of your heart. It's not possible. It's expensive. But it's easy to make a blood test to see the lipo A. It costs, what, 10 pounds? It's about 12 Swiss francs. I mean, it's nothing. So she was here. And they say it's genetic. It cannot change. So let's see a little magic there. After nine months, no, four months, it went to four, what is that? 446. So what was it? Oh, 840 oh, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. 841. But this patient did not want to follow my advice. She said, I'm not going to change my food. I'm not going to take too much product, too much pills, because I said you have to take vitamin C, proline, lisa, and, and so on. She said, oh, that's too much. I said, okay, let's make it on the wise way so I can use her also for my study. She accepted, that's why I put the name here. So I gave her only proline and lysine and a little bit of vitamin C, one cap. Four months after, it dropped there from 861 to 446. After nine months, 363. So we are still higher than the 300. But she didn't change nothing from her lifestyle. And the problem is that you see the homocysteine also, I ask it, it was a bit normal here, a bit high. But since she didn't want to take the complex B, it went higher. Because when you free the lipoprotein A from the artery walls, it will create an inflammatory symptom. This is why some doctors think the LDL can be oxidated and create problems. In fact, when the patient takes um, proline and lysine, it will take the lipo A out. So it will create an oxidation. But it's because of the factor of reparation, not because of destruction of the arteries. It's important to understand. So when she saw the number that it was much better here, 363 and 239, I said, you know, the risk of heart disease is going down, but you get more pain. You will get pain in the chest because it's an inflammatory symptom. She said, yes. So I said, OK, you have to drink less, stop the meat, because she eats meat three times a day every day. I'm sorry. I didn't tell her to become vegetarian. This is impossible. <laughs> but to reduce. She didn't accept. But she accepted to take the pills. <laughs> so if she'd done that along the dietary, it would have been a much more significant... Here result. is the second paper. <laughs> Not that yet, yet. So here we were, 366. So she accepted to take the B-complex. So we reduced the homocysteine at 10.2, which is below 15. It's totally correct. This was done in four months. I'm waiting for the other paper because I will see her in May. Because she accepts to change the diet. So I'm eager to see the other document. So is the lipoprotein staying the same? Or? Yeah, because she, I think there she stopped to take the lysine and proline. Oh. She wanted to be complex. But you see, it increased only from four point, no, from uh, three point. So by stopping to taking the proline and lysine, it didn't really go back to eight something. Because you'd already made all those changes. Exactly. Means the arteries start to repair, but slowly. So I did not panic. When I see 366, it's not really a big problem. I mean, medically, it's 300. But considering she was at 841 something, it's OK. We have time. And now I know she's taking the proper component. How old is she? Uh, something like 52, I think. Something like 52. I'm not quite sure. But the date must be here. Um, is it 51? Yeah, she must be 51. It's about this age. I have a lot of patients. <laughs> Oh, well, I ordered them from the foundations. But I will answer your question after about that. Because I'm not here to, to speak about product. I'm here to speak about component. HPCM don't take care of nothing like that. So what is important to have as a product to help the cells as a component is vitamin C, proline, lysine, beta-carotene also, alpha-tocopherol, glucosamine, manganese, and B-complex. This will ensure you a healthy arteries and a healthy reparation factor. Of course, this is not a product. Those are component. Uh, if you put your names on this paper, I will send you my presentation by mail. It's free, yeah? so you don't have to write everything. <laughs> okay, so remember that cholesterol is produced by two-thirds by your body. So it's not the killer. It's necessary. If you don't have cholesterol because you take too much medications, we will see it after also, you get problems. Tingling in the hand, pain, loss of memory, weakness. If you have enough cholesterol, you get stronger, more energy, you resist to the cold. It's not a problem, so it's vital. It's a vital component. And one third is exogenous, brought from the food. So it cannot be the cause of heart disease. And when you take a statin, beta blockers, and all this, you must know that it cuts the production of cholesterol from the body. So we cannot produce coenzyme Q10. Without Q10, the brain is not working well. The muscle can do pain. The vitamin D, which is essential for the bones, essential for the brain. We know, as an example, that people with depression are lacking vitamin D. The psychiatrists know this. And if you take statins, 
You get depression, you get stress, because also of the low level of vitamin D. The gallbladder, when you eat a cheese, a cheddar or something like that, or gruyere in my country, will not be able to digest it correctly without making a stomach pain if you take statins, because it will not allow the gallbladder to work correctly. It's written on the back, but nobody reads it. And uh, for the men and women, the sexual hormones go down, so it's not good. So, most animals in nature are creating their vitamin C. The tigers, the cats. Okay, the cats does not really make that. It's a PowerPoint presentation for that. I mean, it's uh, Photoshop. <laughs> but it's a real tiger. And Geneva, we made some dissection. Yes, we have to cut the animals and measure. I don't like to do this, but for science, okay. And we see that in some animals, like the sheep, the cat, the bats, the wolf, no, not the wolf, the renard, the, like a, fox. the fox, yes. Um, the beef, what is that? That's the donkey, well, a lot of animals, even the rabbit. When you look at their kidney, we found up to two grams of vitamin C inside. So if we can find two grams inside the kidney, you can make times three, that's what they produce. So it's a lot, little rabbit with six grams of vitamin C. And we have a big rabbit with no vitamin C, I mean, we need to take it. Huh? Okay, what about the bears? Wow. That's a big animal, huh? <laughs> that's a happy one. So they have no heart disease at all, but their cholesterol level is 400 to 600 milligrams per deciliter. They should be dead if we take the medical theory. But their, pro their body produces from 40 grams to 70 grams of vitamin C. Yeah, that's a big animal. <laughs> the Eskimo, they are not animals. <laughs> They are mainly eating animal fat and fish because there is no apple tree in Greenland. There is no carrot in Greenland. They can barely uh, bury their people because it, the ground is icy. They have no heart disease because they take the vitamins from the fish, from the big animals that they eat. Because in their fat, they get the vitamin C and the omega. You know, EPA, DHA, and all that, omega-6. Omega-3 mainly because omega-6 a little bit. So they have no heart disease. So those, is, those are a paradox because they should be dead if we take the cholesterol theory. That's a new race. I call this the Canido obesius. <laughs> That's a very fat dog. Dog produce vitamin C on a little scale. But if they are fed non properly, like this dog, which is a dog from a living room, I can say, it's not going outside too much. They get fat and they get heart disease because of the bad diet. Remember, animals do not produce lipoprotein A. So what happened to this guy? From the food, from the bad fat. It clogged his arteries and his process of reparation was not enough because it's not enough and he cannot do walking, he cannot do nothing. This is why you need to ask your doctor to follow you correctly. This is a, a sheet we use in Switzerland. I'm aware that it is not the same in London, it is not the same in France, but the numbers are the same even in China. Everywhere in the world is the same. The doctors, they ask you for HDL, LDL, triglyceride, schluss. With this, if you want to have fun and you have money to spend, you go into the doctor, you make a cholesterol testing. Maybe you will be okay. And you go to the restaurant, you take a sausage, you take a big cheese, and you go to another doctor to make a testing. It will not be the same test. <laughs> it will not be the same number. Maybe one test will tell you that you're okay, the other one will tell you that you have a heart problem. This is modifying, the cholesterol is changing every time. So to get a, a good diagnosis, you need to ask lipoprotein A and the homocysteine. Those are the two factors that you must ask to see if there is a problem when you have a patient, or if you're a patient, okay? Now, heart failure, what can I tell you about that? Well, the 3 December 1967, Mr. Christian Barnard, which was a doctor, was making the first heart transplantation on this planet that was successful. Sorry, just going back to If you ask your GP for that, your first test, when they get the results through, what would they advise? They if cannot advise you nothing. Yeah, so. This is why they don't do the test. <laughs> because the test exists. There was enough fight, they enough don't science. Know how to treat it. They don't know. No, but now you know that for homocysteine, it's complex B. Mm -hmm. You can show them the literature, and even though you can show them my PowerPoint. And if you ask me for that when I send you the PDF of the presentations, you can say, uh, Fabrice, can you send me the scientific studies for that? And I will get you to my site where you can download the study to give to your GP. Because when I tell you that homocysteine can be converted into cysteine and methionine, it is not my invention. You go to a basic biochemic school, they know that. It's a basic process. But the GP forget. And since they are 
paid by the, they are not paid by the pharma, but they get their medication from the pharma on what they can prescribe and what they cannot prescribe, they often see medications. They rarely see vitamins because it's not really in the book from the uh, Novartis, Sanofi Aventis, uh, and La Roche, and all those pharma. So the doctor has the book of what, oh, pain, okay, I can prescribe this. They, okay, I can prescribe this. It's not written vitamin C in his book. You can remind him. <laughs> and if he tells you, oh, I don't believe this. But they already think I'm crazy about GP anyway. Yes, but <laughs> there, is a, there is a way of thinking that they might think you're crazy, but then they might think, you might think that they're not informed. They might go back to school to learn the things. Because now everything has been scientifically proven. It's no, an... It is not, um, I'm bringing you fact, what we know, what has been tested in more than 10 universities. It's not we think that it might be, no, no. It's called a hypothesis because we bring the hypothesis, but the facts are there. So to go back to Christian Bardar, he was called the man of the year because he made the first transplantation, but we forgot to say that his patient died 18 days after. But the surgery was a success. He died himself at 78 from severe asthma or heart disease. It is not clear what we found on the internet. And he could not operate already. Uh, his hand was not really good. Then, when you take the perspective of cellular medicine between the transplantation and the uh, nutrient, it's quite a big question. So we did some tests. And we have seen that if we take a pigeon in Geneva and we suppress the vitamin B1 from his food, the bird doesn't look really good. He cannot even walk or fly. It's a real pigeon. Then you give him back vitamin B1, okay? And the pigeon can fly and walk and look more happy. B1 was discovered by a Nobel Prize called Christian Eichmann. Here, a Dutch guy. He was a Nobel Prize of 1929 for this discovery. He discovered Vitamin B1, that's what we will learn in school. Then you have to dig into the archive of library to know what he discovered. He discovered that vitamin B1 was the cause of, um, not heart failure, but of, uh, what's the name of this thing, of beriberi. When you go to Africa, you have kids with a little belly like that, it's called beriberi. What he wrote in his thesis is that beriberi is the first symptom of heart failure. This means, on a human case, when there is a heart transplantation that is required here, because the heart is big, the patient may die. It's not a game. You give him vitamin B1. This was done after a couple of months. Must be written here. Well, you can put the heart back to normal, right there, by B1, oral doses. So if people can do intravenous B1, intramuscular, sorry, it is even more interesting. So we can do that also. So nutrition is very, very important. And this occurs in 10 years. It, you don't get heart failure in two days. We have tested it on patients as well. So on some studies, you can see before and after. And some of the studies didn't change because the patient didn't follow the therapy. They quit the studies. So we have to keep the data. So it's like there is no change. But there is no patient to change. So it doesn't change. But when they take the, the, the B1, we see on heart failure, there is a good improvement. So the question is, when you have a surgeon, do we change the heart or, or do we fill up the tank? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> it's a good question. Because mainly, sometimes it's more a fuel problem than a motor problem. Arrhythmia. So arrhythmia is a problem of heartbeat. It's not regular. So we see that the cells of the heart to work correctly, the cell of the electric part needs to be fed correctly as well. And if they lack nutrient, mainly vitamin C that you can put on top of everything. Carnitine, magnesium, and coenzyme Q10, hearts start to work correctly again. And remember when you take statin, the Q10 is not produced by the body anymore. So people who get statin for uh, high cholesterol, often they get arrhythmia. What does the GP does? He gives anti-arrhythmic. But that's how it works. Did he give magnesium? Sometimes. Q10, never. Vitamin C, that's the... They fear vitamin C. They don't want to hear this word. So that's the study we've done. Below 50, there is no more arrhythmia. Everybody starts at 100. The placebo group, sometimes they change their nutrition. They are in the study. They want to make some change. They get fake pills. OK, but they change something in their lifestyle. So placebo gets 74% of improvement. The person with the correct nutrient and the healthy lifestyle change, 48% of improvement on arrhythmia. At 48%, there's no need to take any medication. Interesting. High blood pressure. 
hypertension. So it's the same thing. I'm not going to repeat myself too much. But once you have the arteriosclerosis, you have then the atherosclerosis. Those names must be familiar to you now. The lipo A is going into the arteries. The artery is getting smaller. So there is hypertension. And after hypertension, the plaque is releasing. And then heart disease. So when you have hypertension, the doctor gives you anti-hypertensive medications. He gives you also syndrome or cardioaspirin. So the blood is more fluid. And you keep the hypertension. Can the you have low blood pressure and still heart disease? Um, low blood pressure is something else. Or normal blood pressure and heart disease? Yes, you can with the lipo A. Because the blood pressure, if you have lipo A, you will not always have the pressure that's going high. That's why people seem to be normal and suddenly they have heart because disease. Well, Good blood pressure and his heart disease. Yes, he because he lacks vitamin C. That's the thing. And there is no symptom. So yes, it's possible. And we see that if we have a high blood pressure, the heart rate is normal. The blood vessels are narrowed, but the pressure is high. If we take beta blockers, the heart rate is suppressed artificially. The blood vessels are still narrowed, and the pressure is low and sometimes too low, because it's difficult to put a good balance on that. If you take essential nutrients, the heart rate is normal, the blood vessels are normalized, I already explained the process many times, and the pressure is normalized. This is what has been done on patient. So we see here the high heart beat, so the high blood pressure, and uh, that's the systole and the diastole, yeah. And after it's reached this point, some student told me in Geneva that why doesn't it go lower here? Why don't we take the study up to here? Well, because once it's on this measurement at 140, there is no requiring to take medications. We cannot have a heart disease at two beats per minute. It's not possible. So here it's 140 for something like 80. It's totally normal. So there's no risk. So with nutrient, we know that we can control that. So now you know that heart disease are 90% due to a nutrient deficiency. 90%. If you wish to know more, Dr. Raff has written a book about heart disease, and everything is really inside. I did not take uh, those books with me, because as you see, that's my luggage. I can carry it with one hand. If it was full of book, I could not carry it at all, <laughs> and it would not be big enough. So if you put me your names on the paper that is oh, something uh, somewhere in the room, I guess, you'll get all the information about this. There is also other books that are interesting to read. There is a book of an uh, English doctor called Steve Heike and Harry Robert, who's called Ascorbat, the sense of vitamin C. It is not as explicit as Dr. Raff's book, of course, because Dr. Raff is the pioneer. But this book will help you to know what you can do with vitamin C, because there is not one disease that occurs without vitamin C deficiency, from lepra to white hair to all that. So it's really interesting to know. And that's the famous book from Louis Spooning that he wrote in the 70s, that you can still find on Amazon or Price Minister. I also recommend you to buy this book from Dr. Raff about the victory over cancer. Because in this, you'll have enough information to help the people with cancer and to know how to prevent it and how to cure it. It's explained on the scientific matters, but with easy, easy words. It's very easy to understand. Even my boy, Theo, I have three kids of nine years old, could understand the book. Yeah. So now your health depends on you and on your choice. So now what can you do? Yeah. Well, take vitamin C on a daily basis. Because sick organs equal sick body, and lack of vitamin C equals sick cells. And you know that when you're healthy, well, you don't take medications. So the pharma don't sell you medications, so they will have maybe 90% less of money, but it's not your problem. And the regeneration of the cells, you feel that the body's always trying to heal. I mean, yeah. do they respond very well? Of course. When you stop the body, there is, of course, some symptoms that can occur because if the, body, if the people are smoking or have an unhealthy diet and you repair, they might get laxative effect, dizziness effect. Those are the toxins that are going out. But I'm not speaking about a cleansing therapy. After it's good also to clean up the toxins, but this is something else to do. I will need five hours to speak to you about the whole concept. Yes? Hello, sorry, I'm very sorry I was late. Um, I just wanted to ask, if you've basically had a uh, cardiac arrest and you've now got a defibrillator, yeah. No, it's not too late. It's never too late. Somebody with a defibrillator, even with a pacemaker, on taking vitamin C, it will not change the heartbeat. But if the person starts to take the Q10 and start to take magnesium, uh, it will have to recalibrate the machine because the nervous system will work correctly. Uh, I don't think they will remove it. No, no, they will not remove it. It's for life. Yeah.
It should be possible, but it's a surgery, and making too much surgery is not good. Yeah. You have to break the ribs and all that, it's not that good. So, what you can do is, if you're a therapist, you can join the HPCM group, then you will get all the information to help your patient. The adhesion to get in the group is totally free. You can be a student of natural medicine, now it's new, this status, or you can be a registered therapist. If you're not um, a therapist, you can join the Doctor of Health Alliance to have the, how can I say that, the knowledge to use it correctly. Everything is free, and you can even do some courses. The Alliance works like this, because the Alliance, of course, they do sell product. I'm not the Alliance, I'm the HPCM group. I'm here, on this side. The Alliance is on this side. So I'm providing the information. And when they, they sell product, everything goes back to the Alliance, and the profit goes to the foundation. The foundations pay the doctors to make the study. So it's a cycle that goes like this. It's a non-profit organization. So it's important that you know that. Okay, I think I make the, my time must be on, my must be out, I think.